Eh, Luca, se vuoi magari staccano un attimo così ti presento. Sì. Poi iniziamo, siamo già live su Facebook. Prova a togliere lo schermo condiviso. Dunque, sto, sto combattendo con queste celle. Senti, vado perché sì. qua un, sta per scatenarsi un ubicaggio, ho paura che mi... <ride> <ride> Voglio lanciarti prima che... Sì, so, l'unica, come... l'unica cosa che non, non riesco più a vedere è il, il, il grid video. Guarda in alto sulla sinistra e, e clicca il pallino verde, insomma, in maniera da, da fare i resize. Sì, però in questo, in questo momento vedo solo alcuni, alcuni nomi. E... Allora, vediamo un po'. Così meglio. Eccolo qua. Dai, lascia così. Sì, qua. lascio così, abbi pazienza, ma se no, sono pianto solo casino. <laughs> so, good morning everyone, and uh, I'm uh, very happy to have here uh, today, uh, not here, but here in, uh, in another way, Professor Luca Rossi from Turin. Uh, he is a, a very good friend of uh, our School of uh, Parasitology in Sassari. And uh, he has a, a great experience uh, with uh, wildlife parasitosis. And uh, for this lesson, I asked him to um, present you to speak about the interaction uh, uh, between uh, uh, parasites, uh, humans, and also domestic species. What are the most important differences in managing uh, uh, parasitosis uh, for uh, wildlife species or domestic animals? Uh, he will uh, reply to this question and also show his experience and uh, of course uh, will reply to your uh, questions uh, at the end. So have a, a nice lesson and see you later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. I'm very pleased to of your in- invitation and uh, I'll try to do my best to Um, explain to the people attending this webinar, uh, which is the difference in feeling and in action when we have to deal with parasites of wildlife compared with parasites from livestock. I will use the term parasite in a a very broad sense uh, in that I will not refer only to the classic parasite, but also to uh, a range of pathogen that may cause diseases and management problem in wildlife. I want to start with this sentence. I invite people to read it rapidly and I want to stress the aspect of the point of view. I'm very surprised that such an open mind that the sentence was uh, written and published by the president of the American Veterinary Medical Association because veterinarians grow in a different milieu with a different idea and basically for most the veterinarian I know the parasite in the broad sense of the term are something to destroy, possibly to eradicate. This is a view which is biased toward production, toward protection of human health, but it's not my personal view, not the view of people who have a priority for conservation and a view on populations. I, what I want to mean is that parasite to me 
and not only to me, fortunately, are uh, a very important part of the general biodiversity. There is a lot of parasite. Each individual host may have tens of parasites. And there is also an opinion that parasite must have equal rights as all other species on earth. But I'm not a philosopher of parasite and I will try to fly down like this nice bird that many of us know and try to explain me through examples. Everybody knows what parasitism mean is something at the advantage of one of the two actors and to the harm of the second actor. But often parasitism is also tending to commensalism. So animals may harbor parasites that de facto do not produce any uh, appreciable harm, not even in wildlife. And then the same individual and the same species may harbor many parasites. And the multi-parasitism is a, a normal condition in, in wildlife. I will stress once more that the term parasite that I will use in this, in this talk refer to the classic parasites. So protozoan, elements, insect, and arachnids, but also to fungi, bacteria, virus, and prions. One interesting thing is that a lot of biological phenomena have this kind of uh, distribution, the normal distribution that all of you knows. But if you refer to the large majority of parasites, this is the rule, an aggregated or overdispersed distribution where the vast majority of individual hosts harbor no parasite or a very limited number of parasites that create a sort of commensalism between them. And just a minority on the right side of the slide uh, harbor a lot of parasite, the majority of the population and they may suffer from loss of production, from disease, even death. The aggregated distribution is the effect of the heterogeneity of the spatial distribution of infectious stages. Imagine that uh, larvae of uh, strongyle are not homogeneously distributed over the pasture and that uh, the deer one may eat 100 more larvae than deer B, uh, which is grazing by him. But it's also due to the heterogeneity of the immune system, which is not the same, even in the same herd of deer. Depends on natural selection, who tries to eliminate the most susceptible genotypes but also depend on seasonality. There are a lot of parasites which feel better during winter and other ones which feel better during summertime, although we know another risk factor like sex and age, for instance, in the wild ruminants living in mountain environment like an alpine ibex, um, if we study strongyle, we notice that uh, being a male and being an adult male is an important risk factor. An over dispersed distribution uh, is telling us that there is an equilibrium in course. So the question that I pose to you is the following. Does it make sense to intervene on phenomena and processes which are in equilibrium? Uh, this is not a normal question when we deal with livestock, but it is a normal, must be a normal question when we deal with wildlife. 
And on the lower ground, does it make sense to use an antialmintic in a free ranging population of the deer for the sole purpose to have greater antlers? This is an image representing a tremendous trophy of red deer in New Zealand, but it is doping. This is not respecting the nature and conserving the diversity. If you feel close to my view, uh, I invite you to read uh, this article. I can send it to you in, the, in this full form. Who begin with equal rights for parasite is is beautiful. Is open minded. You will be happy to read. It's also short to read. And what we must thank parasite when we deal with wild species is that this diversity, this great number of different pathogen continuously stimulate the part of the genome which have to do with immune response, the major histocompatibility complex. And uh, it is not the case that even the most endangered species, the most vulnerable species on earth, have an interesting variety and diversity at this special major compatibility complex. It is an investment on, uh, on future. And when we have little variability in this particular part of the genome, these are the problems. They are the problems. In view to discussing example, I have tried to um, functionally subdivide the parasite into uh, three groups. The first one is the host specific parasite. I mean the parasite which you may find only in an individual species or at best in very closely zoologically related species. For instance, I, Amiria are the example of uh, a specific parasite, but there are, for instance, um, elements that you may find only in the chamois or only in a, an alpine ibex. And the same is true for nasal boats, for hippoderma, for oncocherca, and for lice. These examples are not a case because where I live, which is the northwest part of Italy, in the Alps, at the beginning of the 60s of the past century, there were, there were not at all any red deer and raw deer, which are now very common. It, it is only thanks to farsighted people that these animals were reintroduced where they were present centuries before. At that time, in the valley where I live, which is the valley of Susa, for who knows a little bit of geography of northern Italy, um, very few funders were released. And these funders, which were coming from the actual Slovenia, were very poor in parasite. They basically brought no or very few parasite from their original parasite community. So, going back to the previous slide, when after more than 40 years from the release, we started seeing again parasites like this one, which are typical of red deers in other parts of Europe, and which derived from other in production, which were carried out in neighboring valley from other zones, of Europe, I was personally very happy. I was not concerned with the appearance of new parasites because they were host specific. They were reconstituting the variability, the diversity of the parasite community of this host. No need to treat them. Today, I would never treat a deer before releasing him in a new area. 
because I ask myself, why should I disturb the equilibrium that developed in hundreds of thousands of years, possibly creating a vacuum, a niche for new parasite with unknown pathogenicity? So I, I prefer to respect this parasite, to give them equal rights. But this is not the case for other parasites, which are completely alien and which derive from unwise introduction, not even reintroduction. For instance, in the region when I live, uh, the Wapiti was released and the Wapiti brought with himself a large liver fluke, the great American liver fluke, which was not even known at the time of the introduction, which was, which occurred two centuries ago, more, more or less. And another parasite was more recently introduced with the unwise introduction of the sicker deer in other parts of uh, Europe, namely in, in France in this case, then red deer were captured in France, were released in our territory and created uh, a possibility of survival for a stomach nematode, which is a Schwarzius sidemis, which is also quite pathogenic. The same applies to parasite of other alien hosts like the gray squirrel and uh, and uh, the mini lepre. I, I don't remember the name, the name in English, which are now very common in uh, in our zones. Finally, there is a third group, which I want to name here: generalist parasites. These are parasites which are common, for instance, in domestic ruminant like sheep and goats and maybe cross transmitted, maybe give rise to spill over to wildlife. Some examples are toxoplasma or a kinococcus or uh, the normal liver fluke facial hepatica on other dangerous helming, stomach helming like a mongus contortus and telajorsaja or, uh, or mice lysercoptes and ticks, which are now uh, populating high altitude in the Alp as uh, an effect of the global warming. I think there is no doubt that if we can, if we want, if there is a reason, we can combat and try to eradicate alien parasite, just like we should try to combat and eradicate their host. I'm also convinced that we may, not we are obliged to, but we may try to counteract, control, but not eradicate, in my opinion, the generalist parasite at the interface between wildlife and domestic animals, and eventually a risk for men, under three main conditions, which are the following. The first situation is that wildlife is or is going to become the reservoir of parasites in broad sense, which are harmful for humans. Maybe it is not completely correct from the global view that humans have a priority on animals, but in a way or the other, this is the case. We saw it now with the COVID crisis. Second situation, when wildlife is or is going to become the reservoir of parasite of major economic impact on livestock production. And finally, the third situation when generalist parasite of livestock severely threaten the health of wildlife through spillover mechanism. So let's see some example of the three situation. As you got the first one, Rabies, uh, rabies, sylvatic rabies was, I was, I'm happy to use was and is, was a huge problem in uh, Europe up until a few decades ago. It is uh, a tremendous disease, we'll see that later. And the reservoir of the sylvatic rabies is the red fox. So if we want and we have the budget to combat and try to eradicate rabies. We must do that. And we have the tools 
Now, a second problem always related to a Fox reservoir is alveolar echinococcosis. We see an image of a patient who at this stage is quite close to, to death, we must say it sadly. Example of the second situation which are taking the scene now in Europe are the African, uh, the African swine fever, SAF, and the tuberculosis. The African swine fever is present in Sardinia, and uh, Antonio knows very well. In Sardinia, there is uh, a sort of long story and special story, but in Europe, there is uh, much concern about the possibility that this disease of wild boars may be transmitted to swines and create enormous economic problem. Just imagine if the market of our famous ham toward the United States should be blocked by the presence of this disease in Northern Italy. A second famous classic problem is the badger as a reservoir of bovine tuberculosis in, in UK, when a lot of money has been spent to try to eradicate tuberculosis, which is a zoonosis, and the things are complicated by the fact that badgers have turned into an alternative and complementary reservoir of this infection. And finally, as a the third situation, just three famous examples. One is sarcoptic mange, which is occurring with uh, severe epidemic waves in Spain and in, in Italy, in particular in a mountain dwelling ruminant like the Iberian ibex in the picture. In the middle, you see a saiga. Saiga in Mongolia were reduced very much uh, to an authentic bottleneck by a recent epidemic of PPR, a viral disease which is known with the French name Pest de Petit Ruminant. And on the right side of the slide, we see one of the rarest canid in the world, Ethiopian wolf whose number was uh, remarkably reduced by canine distemper. Beyond these three situations, much of the remaining are not true problems, in my opinion, but they are false problems. And I give you an example. Quite a lot of money is destined in several countries, including uh, Italy, to, to treat foxes against sarcoptic mange or scabies. But why that? It is an individual approach. The fox sarcoptes is natural, is a regulatory factor, is that it does not derive immediately from dogs. It may infect dogs. It is just the opposite. And when other wild carnivores are infected through contact with dogs, like the wolf, which is much more interesting from the conservation point of view, the wolf is quite resistant, fortunately, to this disease. So why? Why do we want to force nature? I think it is a false problem. It is a problem of uh, uh, restricted view of wildlife and transformation of a wild animal into a sort of domestic one. At least I don't want that this waste of money uh, is done in my name. And so let's go to a fascinating discipline, in my opinion, which is the health management of wildlife. It is fascinating because it is investigation. There is a lot of research 
to be done when you have to deal with the control of the disease, but it's not only research. And at the same moment is not only management, it is a management that is based on investigation, applied investigation. So in a way it touches our wish to investigate. I think we share this passion, but also our wish to do something, not just study things and let them as they are. The difference is that this kind of discipline is aimed to place the sanitary problem affecting free-ranging wildlife into an operative context. What I mean is that we must generate solution which permit to the responsible people, the resource manager to operate motivated choices whenever a disease is affecting a wild species. So which are the typical questions for people who is involved in wildlife disease management? One question is the question we treated before. Are we dealing with a true problem or with a false problem? A true conservation problem or a problem which is limited to the uh, human feeling of some group of citizens, more or less strong socially? And other typical questions are who are we primarily wishing to protect in a multi host community some wildlife may be more important than other wildlife and we must know exactly which is our which is our goal and how we can do it how we can protect the species that we want to protect and which strategies and tools are available available to reach the goal and if I can realistically use this tool in field condition, there are a lot of tools that are copied by uh, the veterinary expertise on livestock, but which cannot be effectively used in wildlife. And many other questions, of course. But to work on the health management of wildlife, we need some prerequisites. The first one is obvious, I think. Uh, you, we need some, someone who cares because management is expensive. And we need, of course, the interest of public health agencies at first, up to private hunters, for instance, when we deal with game. When we have to do with wild ruminant, uh, the general public is uh, rarely uh, wishing to cooperate. I would say a bit sadly, but the general public is more prone to be interested by uh, diseases affecting a group of animals which are closer to pets. The second prerequisite is having robust nets. Uh, uh, we will see a slide on it have a technical background and a strong motivation by all players since our action are usually affected when they are prolonged in the long term. As you got nets, um, let me suggest you to, suggest you worry, young people usually, to invest time in creating your net. It is good time invested. Spend time around the table with a beer and let people talk of their feeling. Let's collect information. Let's become reliable for people in the field that may be your eyes on wildlife diseases. Having goodness means having since the beginning uh, a reliable passive surveillance, like we would define it with a veterinary term. And in practice, a lot of volunteers that are happy to share information with you and help you when it's needed. 
then you need some technical and logistic background, but just some at the beginning. I, I was lucky in a way because in, in my region, I can rely on uh, places like the one you see in the slide. They are check station where game is brought the same day they're hunted. And so if you're a technician or you've collaborated with technician, you have a privileged site where animals are measured, weight, where you make a good estimation of age, when if needed, you take biological sample for your survey. But when I refer to technical background, I refer also to the capacity to capture animals, living animals, not just shooting them with uh, tail anesthesia or with nets or whichever tool is necessary for the individual species and situations. And then this is very important. Work with enthusiastic people, with people who don't look at the Howards, who smile, who is convinced as you are that the day you spend in the field is probably one of the best days in the years. I'm quite old, as you can see, but every time I'm out to capture an Ibex, for me, it's like the first time and I'm so happy at the end of the day. So. And then I arrived to a slide which I invite you to, to remember for your mental scheme. It is very simple. It was uh, the result of uh, a famous article by Gary Wobeser, who was the, the Canadian uh, vet and was also the, the father of wildlife disease management. And it says that the solution we have to find uh, may be categorized into four groups. The prevention, which means anticipating the introduction of a novel pathogen into a naive population. The control, which is another thing, means to reduce the incidence, the effect, and or the diffusion of an already existing disease. The third group is a more ambitious one, is the eradication, Sometimes eradication is a good goal. Most of the time, as I anticipated you, is, is not something to, to try to obtain for respect of diversity, of biodiversity. Eradication, of course, means to eliminate an already existing disease. But finally, there is a fourth category which we usually do not consider when we have to deal with human diseases and uh, livestock diseases, which is a no intervention, which is better known with the French name laissez-faire. No intervention does not mean that we do not nothing because we are not able to do nothing or we don't want to do nothing, but it means that when you study a problem, you may decide at the end that doing nothing is the best option. And this often apply with wildlife diseases. And I will show you some examples. Sometimes it's a matter of necessity, but usually is a matter of choice. Let's begin with the prevention. And I will show you some recent example. Uh, in the picture, we are in the Pyrenees, on the French side of the Pyrenees, where this beautiful animal, the Bucardo, which is the Iberian ibex, the subpopulation, which was typical of the Pyrenees, became officially extinct in the year 2000, when the last female died. But had already remained to a very low population site for at least a couple of centuries. So it was a, a great success of people of the National Park of Pyrenees when after years of discussion and trade-off, they were assigned a good number of founders captured in a, 
in Spain to recreate a population of this icon animal. In this case, prevention meant some practical things that were, first of all, making a checklist of the infection and diseases that should not have to be transported to the new site in France. It took some time to make this kind of prioritization, which had to do with literature, with the severity of diseases for a similar wildlife species already native to Pyrenees, and the uh, eventual transportation of diseases of livestock, which were not present on the, in France, but are still present in, in Spain. After creating the checklist, uh, the people involved in the project uh, find out a suitable population, which answered to two requisites. The first one having a sufficient genetic variability, which is a good investment for the long-term success of the operation. And second, who had been very carefully followed and known from the sanitary point of view, means that passive and active surveillance have been carried out intensively in the years preceding the operation. This population was found not far from Madrid in the Sierra de, de Guadarrama, and uh, of course in the area a good expertise in capturing animals was available. So there was a huge sanitary work behind the reintroduction in term of prevention. Of course, one of the disease that were extremely carefully checked was scabies, which is a true problem in this kind of animals. Prevention would have avoided the introduction in Europe of the Great American liver fluke, which is now running, if you can see from the small map on the right, along the Danube Valley from the Czech Republic to Croatia, now trying to enter into Slovenia. Of course, today it is easy for us to say that these were unwise introduction and following reintroduction, but at that time in 1863, when Wapitis was first transported from America to my region, Piedmont, the number one in the map, nobody was aware, was sensible to this kind of view that we have now, and not even the Great American liver fluke was known. It was described for the first time in, uh, in Piedmont. But now we cannot do this kind of mistake anymore. And uh, the previous study of the sanitary situation of founders of a population from where founders will be captured and on the local situation must be an absolute prerequisite of any operation of this kind. Sometimes prevention means other things. It means, for instance, using strategically some natural or artificial barriers to impede to outbreak disease to spread fastly. In, in the picture, you can see uh, the highway from Oviedo to Leon in Spain, which is fortunately uh, arresting for the moment the spread of uh, a sarcoptic mange epidemic toward the so-called occidental nucleus of, uh, um, of Shami, of southern Shami. And the picture in the right of the slide refers to the river Inn, which is now stopping uh, for several decades now the spread of uh, the same disease in another host, which is the Northern Shami and the Alpine Ibex. 
Prevention may also mean working to improve the management and improve the health of livestock, which is living more and more closer to wildlife in environment, like for instance, the Alps. The white animal in the slide is an hybrid between a domestic goat and, uh, and an ibex. It is not a good sign if you have hybrid within two capra representative, means that domestic goats are not well managed. They are kept free, they are kept without control, and they may crossbreed and cross as many diseases to my more precious species, which is the Alpine Steinbuck. And in the right part of the slide, you see how close you can quite frequently now see wildlife mixing with livestock, permitting the transmission of uh, infection and parasite, which were basically not transmissible when the number of wildlife was much lower as 30 or 50 years ago. Probably with a better management of sarcotic mange in domestic goat, the great nuclei of a billion ibex represented in the map would have never been contaminated. It would have never suffered the great mortality they have suffered and they are still suffering now. On the other hand, we must not think that the contact between wildlife and their domestic relative is uh, at the origin of problem. We must not think the sheep and goats are always the devil when they get in contact with chamois or uh, ibex. And we also must be aware that maintaining a naive status against all infection of ruminants is a risky option for wildlife. I put a slide here of the Abruzzo chamois, which is particularly precious species endemic to central Italy. When we carried out studies on serological studies uh, on this animal, we surprisingly found that there were basically no zero reactor against any of the most common infectious diseases of sheep and goats. In a way, this was a good news. But in the other way, we had to do with an, a naive population that sooner or later would have come in contact with domestic animals with a probably severe effect due to the native status. There is a nice example of it. In the, in the Pyrenees, not far from Barcelona. Uh, in the 90s, a new virus was described, was a, a border disease virus of the serotype 4, who became accustomed to uh, chamois after spillover. This virus was at the beginning very deadly one, and there are population in along the Pyrenees where mortality is up to 85%, decrease rate of 85%, which is enormous, if you think, were killed by this virus. But then the virus spread along the Pyrenean chain. And it was noted, was studied that the herd of Shami which coped best with a new pathogen was in the easternmost part of the Pyrenees, in the, uh, in the reserve of hunting of Fraser and Setcaches. And this what why? Because these chamois were in strict contact during summertime with transhumant sheep and goats. So they were used to become in contact with other pestivirus, other genotypes of uh, the border disease, 
which created a sort of vaccination against the new border disease virus. And they were almost completely protected. And the decrease rate of this population when it was first affected by BDV4 was basically null. What if they would have never come in contact with livestock? Probably they would have suffered from this new disease similarly at the other population and other parts of the Pyrenees. So we have been able to consider problem by problem the intermingling between domestic and white ruminants. If we shift from prevention to control and eradication, we are talking that we are trying to drive the basic reproductive rate that we now all of us know because of the COVID emergency. Every day we are bombed by calculation of this index. We can have a success if we are able to, if you manage to drive the basic reproductive rate below the value of one. I'm not a mathematician, so I prefer qualitative things. And I want to give you the message that this index depends on many factors, which range from the sympathy with other receptive hosts, the single host system are easier to manage than the other one. The density of the host is an important factor. The life history, for instance, the herd immunity already existing is quite clearly a factor influencing these parameters, but other parameters matter like, for instance, the spatial structure of a wildlife population in the sense that population we have to deal with are not homogeneously distributed over the territory, are usually distributed in social unit, and diseases follow the destiny of this social unit that we must try to know. And then there are ethological factors which create differences. For instance, if we deal with a direct transmission disease like sarcoptic mange, we notice in the field that the spread is much more intense and fast in the alpine ibex, which is frequently daily in contact with the similars compared with the chamois, which is a distance animal. We get in touch with similar only in very special and momentaneous moment of his life. I also invite you to remember this formula. The basic reproductive rate is basically a multiplication between the infection rate in the unit of time multiplied by the length of the infectious period. And this is obviously different from disease and disease from parasite and parasite. There are some action that we may carry out if desirable and if the tools are available to have an influence on the infection rate in the unit of time. Classically, the main measure are three and they are the depopulation, means reducing the density of a population affected by a certain disease. Another way to reduce the density when available is contraception which is an interesting field in development now, but without a true application generally at the moment. And the second tool is vaccination, which is available for some, but not all the diseases. Other action have an influence on the length of the infectious period. And they are the treatment of affected animals or their 
elimination, their selective culling, when the disease status can be recognized from distance, and the removal or carcasses, when carcasses are a way for the pathogen to survive longer in the environment, like in the case of the African swine fever. And I will now briefly discuss you example of what can be do and what is not effective in the management of some diseases, which are famous diseases for the vet, which are brucellosis and tuberculosis at first, they are bacterial diseases, rabies and swine, the classic swine fever, which are viral diseases and sarcoptic major scabies, which is obviously a true parasitic disease. I don't know if all of you are vets or not. So if there are vets in the audience, uh, forgive me for this slide. Just wishing to explain briefly that brucellosis is a zoonosis that humans may be infected by several brucella, but the most important one are brucella abortus derived from cattle and brucella meritensis mostly <clears throat> deriving from small ruminants. Bacteria are particularly abundant in the placenta, in the fetus, in the abortion and stillbirth, and in, in the milk. So the way humans are infected by brucella are the direct contact with uh, abortion and placenta, which is the case of farmers and veterinarians, but may also be infected by drinking raw milk or certain cheese. While worldwide uh, strategies at a national level are carried out with the investment of a lot of money to eradicate uh, brucella, brucellosis um, from domestic animals are in progress and several countries are now brucella free. Unfortunately, there are wild reservoirs of this infection, of which the most famous one is Yellowstone. As you can see, half of all the bison in Yellowstone are infected with brucellosis. It is a brucella abortus. And it has created a lot of problem with farmers because having brucella in cattle means eliminating animals. Sometimes at the end of the eradication program, even eliminating all cattle in a herd. So you may imagine how a farmer may be happy if a bison contaminates his cattle. Lot of funds have been invested to try to control brucellosis in bison with all possible tools. And you see now a technician which is trying to dart a second complementary reservoir of brucellosis, which are elk, uh, the wapiti, which are maintain in large herd by artificial foraging in the Yellowstone National Park because of touristic regions. Without success, up until it was dismissed uh, a few years ago, the problems remain. It, it is a big problem because bison from Yellowstone cannot be used, for instance, to have founders and create new bison population in other suitable areas in North America. So you may imagine what was the surprise in the valley where I live when we managed to get in touch with the first chamois, a native species, 
affected by brucellosis. I remember perfectly that day. What happened? A lot of discussion afterwards, and it was decided to maintain and improve uh, passive and active surveillance, and fundamentally adopt a laissez-faire strategy. We imagine that Shama would have not been, in this case, a good reservoir. So it would have been useless to reduce its density, to try to eliminate intensively the actively infected animals and so on. What we could observe after 10 years, more or less, of uh, uh, monitoring of the situation was fortunately the spontaneous extinction in the short term, a few years. And it was because effectively the chamois was a dead end host, it was a host that at the moment of the maximum spread of Bruxelles, which is the moment of parturition, stays alone. The mother and the kid for 15 or 20 days because reaching again the herd, which is completely different from what happens with the bison, where parturition, as I happen, fortunately to see, occurs within the herd with obvious direct contact with an enormous amount of Bruxelles in that moment. Fortunately, the case was the one I showed you, and no spillback occurred from our chamois to the sanitated livestock living in the area, which was the most important result we were looking for. But there was a second episode. There were many, many other, but the second was more important and is ongoing now. It is an episode observed and described in France. So this is why I maintain the original slide that some colleague gave me as a present about a new outbreak of brucellosis in the in another host, the Alpine Ibex, in a massive in Hotsawa, not far from the town of Geneva. This is an area which is known, I would say worldwide, for a very good cheese. I like cheese and oh, I think you too. Uh, this cheese is named Reblochon. So you may imagine that in the head of farmers, which are a strong lobby in the area, associating a special product deriving from milk with a disease like brucellosis occurring in the ibex was impossible to accept from their point of view. What is interesting is that local livestock had been sanitating and brucella free and deemed brucella free for more than 10 years. So probably Brucella were able to spill over from the last infected cattle into the ibex population and be maintained silently in the ibex for more than 10 years. Under the pressure of farmers, the local politician and uh, Prefetto, the Prefet is a, a strong figure in France, much stronger than any other figures similar that we have in Italy, decided for the eradication since the beginning of this reservoir, meaning the stamping out of the old Ibex population, which was estimated in counting around 500 heads. And what they did were two days of war. I, I can use the, no, no picture is available with the accept of this Ibex hanging down from an helicopter of the gendarmerie of the French police. Uh, the area was closed to everybody. 
uh, police people with strong expertise in the use of rifles were set in different points of the mountain and in two only two days almost 300 ibex were eliminated with a priority for um, older individuals in which the prevalence of brucellosis had resulted higher than in other age classes of course this prompted the reaction of people with another kind of uh, sensitivity to this problem and so they created a protest against this kind of bloody way to manage the problem that we may understand in a way from the point of view of farmers but that is not that open-minded so it was decided to suspend the killing and the culling and uh, go in deep with knowledge and research and uh, i must say that the french state invested many resources in capturing ibex in marking them in sampling them in studies in detail the spatial distribution of the animals and uh, heterogeneity of the prevalence of the disease in the different social unit recognized in the areas. And then what was also interesting is that the, an expert group was created under the umbrella of the ANSES, which is a national agency for animal safety, who studied all the possible scenarios to control and possibly eradicate the disease. And many simulations were done and the mathematical model were extremely refined and used to predict which strategies would have been the most successful under the circumstances. What the model said and the experts said is that the best strategy would have not been trying to make a stamping out to eliminate all animals because simply it would not have been feasible and this kind of disease would have not uh, spontaneously disappear by doing that. So the strategy which was chosen was that of capturing as many ibex as possible by means in this case of uh, teleanesthesia to test and slaughter animals on site means that the animals captured were submitted to a test, a rapid test, which had been developed in the meanwhile, and then they were slaughtered if positive to Brucella, or if negative, they were marked with ear tags and uh, of radio colors and released on site. And then once captured as many animal as possible and eliminated the positive one, eliminate all not marked individual, meaning the individual who were difficult to capture and were not because of this. This strategy was refined. It was followed and was refined in years. And there was a true fine tuning of the strategy based on result of the research that I presented in the slide before. And once again, it means then the health management of wildlife is not completely management, is not completely research, but is a, a unique mix of both aspects. The strategy was applied with different intensity on the nuclei of ibex, which had showed the highest prevalence. 
and these are the nuclei three and four in the uh, in the map where other nuclei peripheral nuclei was uh, relatively spared by the intervention since the prevalence was already quite low and they were probably the effect of a spreading of the disease from the nuclei three and four with the highest prevalence. This strategy is effective and from initial values of about 50% of positive animals, we are now on average around 10% in the time frame of uh, six, seven years now, which is a great success compared with the difficult social situation that uh, indiscriminate culling had created at, at the beginning. Unfortunately, no vaccination was possible in the field. And this was based on the experimental evidence that when vaccinating with the same vaccine that we use in domestic animals successfully, which are not inactivated vaccine, but are attenuated vaccine, there was then excretion of brucella by vaccinated animals with the risk of perpetuating the disease and creating new strains in the wild. So you have seen that the same disease, brucellosis, basically the same host, which are uh, mountain valley ruminants, gave rise to a different movie. The story is never the same and is to me, another fascinating, fascinating aspect of the management of wildlife diseases. Every story may be different. Every story must be studied and the study must be integrated in actions. The conclusion that the movie is rarely similar in a situation compared with another one, it's the same conclusion of studies <clears throat> on the control of tuberculosis, another important <clears throat> disease of human livestock and also wildlife. For instance, when tuberculosis first appeared in the westernmost part of North Italy in Liguria in wild boars, studies were carried out showing that the wild boar is not a reservoir of the bacterium of tuberculosis, since the infection is localized and uh, spreading in the environment is a rare event limited to uh, a very short age of the wild boar, which is not consistent with the idea of uh, inadequate reservoir. And in fact, the reservoir was represented by cattle which were illegally kept infected in spite of the national rule that we're talking of eradication of tuberculosis. And so working on the domestic reservoir seriously this time permitted to a laissez-faire strategy applied to wild boar to reach the spontaneous extinction of the infection which occurred a couple of years ago. But this situation was different from other foci of tuberculosis, which were discovered in the north of France, where the same lesions were observed in wild boar, but where wild boar were used to share habitat with the red deer in which, as opposite to wild boar, there were open lesions and push a lot of bacilli potentially reaching the environment and eventually infected, infecting cattle and other animals. In this case, wild boar was not specially controlled, was not specially depopulated, but a stamping out, a true stamping out in this case, was decided over the true reservoir, which were the deer. So the deer was eliminated from the, from the area. This thing was 
well presented to the local population, was well explained, was accepted, and once the deer were eliminated, the infected reservoir deer, and the wild boar had become free of uh, tuberculosis, new deer were reintroduced in the area from safe donor populations. But this second situation dealing with tuberculosis is on its turn different from what happens in Spain, where in great enclosure, enormous enclosure in the central and southern part of the countries, artificially high densities of uh, wild boars are maintained to permit a special kind of uh, hunting, which is a very rentable one from the economic point of view, which is the, the Monteria, which in the same day may give rise to this number of uh, uh, culled wild boars. In, a, in this case, so in an artificial case with an artificial density and artificial foraging, it was shown by our Spanish colleague that the wild boar himself could be a reservoir of the pathogen. So you see three different situations, three different movies, three different conclusions. And now we go to sylvatic rabies. Rabies is a, a rare in the Western country, not the rare in other parts of the world. A viral disease usually transmitted by dogs, but in the Western countries, in Europe, only transmitted or fundamentally transmitted by a sylvatic reservoir represented by foxes. I wrote my thesis on rabies many years ago now, and I remember a time in which no vaccination was available. And the control of rabies, not the eradication, the control was carried out essentially by the population, meaning shooting, uh, encouraging hunting with prime, shooting uh, red foxes by specialized uh, gamekeeper, even during the night, but also distributing. It is incredible now, but it was the case at those times distributing poisons to reduce the density of foxes. Uh, poisons are the tremendously efficient way to reduce the density of carnivores, of course. And also, your young people, it will look incredible to you, but also gazing the den, the dens of foxes during period in which the dens were inhabited by the cubs, which is against our welfare feeling now, and which was by chance carried out with the same gas, Zyklon B, which were used to eliminate people during the Second World War by the Nazis, the same. Then finally, some people said, we admit that the control of foxes every year is able to reduce the risk for humans. And this is a matter, was a matter of fact, human cases were extremely rare. But the budgetary investment was strong and uh, the general population in Europe was becoming against this extermination of foxes, uh, not justified by the severity of the risk for human. And so some people saw that trying to vaccinate foxes by the oral route would have been a good idea. There was many people, many virologists, I remember, against 
this uh, innovative approach, but Swiss people had the courage to carry out an experiment in a small island before, and, and then an experiment in the valley in Canton Valais, uh, and then they had such a success that distributing oral vaccine, concentrating oral vaccine to foxes became the standard in Europe. And strategies were developed to uh, have uh, an homogeneous and uh, sound distribution of baits in a territory, even in mountainous territory, where distributing baits by hand would have been difficult and maybe also risky. And what happened is this, is probably what we would like to see after the COVID-19 vaccination, but in that case it happened. It is uh, a graph showing the data from France, and you may notice that there was a long period in which poisons were used, empoisonnement, and then there was a narrow indicating the moment in 1988, in which the technology was available and vaccination were start in the field over huge surfaces. And you can see that the last rabbit fox was in 1995. So it took just seven years to clear a huge country like France, which was completely involved by the presence of fox rabies to have the country rabies free. So it was a true eradication. In my opinion, and in the opinion of many people, justified by the fact that we give a priority to the problems and fears of men. In the case of the classic swine fever, we go back talking about wild boars. Many outbreaks, many stories. I will try to summarize as fast as possible. Some outbreak were regulated after many discussion, I remember, by using a laissez-faire strategy followed by targeted hunting. When I say targeted hunting, I mean that after permitting the development of the peak of the epidemic, start again uh, harvesting wild boars while respecting the adult ones that had been uh, had survived to the outbreak and rather eliminating young and small wild boars, which were naive to the infection. This kind of strategy was used in some parts of uh, Italy and led to the spontaneous extinction of some outbreaks, provided that the outbreaks were not so large in surface and uh, were in a way delimited uh, with respect to other wild boar population, for example, for na from natural or artificial barriers. And it worked. But hunters did not accept this kind of strategy everywhere. And in particular, in uh, an area at uh, limit between France and uh, Germany, they decided that would have been able to control and eradicate this severe disease, which is, I remember you, which blocking the economy of swine and swine products, decided that by strengthening the culling of um, wild boar, they, took, they would have controlled the disease. But the fact demonstrated after many years that this was an unsuccessful 
strategies. And that, as opposite, it favored the endemicity of the disease, a disease that we would have liked to eradicate. And the use of modeling, which is a very interesting ground for research, showed that this unsuccessful strategy was because to have a success, a hunting rate of above 70% of wild boar should have been achieved. But it was not the case. Achieving a, a hunting rate of about 1,700% is uh, far too much, even for uh, hunters, which are very well motivated. So they just strengthened culling, but did not reach the threshold of density that would have been necessary to reach the spontaneous extinction of the disease. And their success was finally obtained when a vaccine became available and the vaccine produced a rapid immunization of the population. Special strategies were developed to permit young animals to be vaccinating, vaccinated by eliminating the competition with subadults and adult. And as you can see from the um, rightmost graph, vaccination implied a reduction of cases, a short peak, and the elimination of the problem in the time frame of maximum two years from the beginning of the vaccination, when in the same areas, the classic swine fever had become endemic for more than 20 years. And finally, I arrived to another disease, which is sarcoptic mange, which we showed before is very deadly in foxes, but it even more deadly in mountain ruminant like the Iberian ibex or the alpine ibex or the chamois. And what is <clears throat> a characteristic of sarcoptic mange is the persistence. I mean that when a population which had not been previously affected by sarcoptic mange for some reason becomes infected, then the disease persists within this population for decades and probably centuries. A second aspect is that there is an obvious difference between populations in that the first wave of the disease may be as deadly as more than 90% decrease rate or relatively uh, benign with mortality below 25%. We don't know it before. We may infer that it is a result of a genetic aspect, but we don't know it before. Starkovic mange in the Alps were first described by Austrian people more than 200 years ago. And ever since the strategies to control the disease, which were mainly based on the population, were completely unsuccessful. And you may see <clears throat> which are these kind of control strategies and which are the weak points. Uh, very classically, uh, German culture hunters were used to apply an initial depopulation at the true beginning of the appearance of the disease in a previously naive herd. But it was calculated that the threshold density to reach extinction was extremely low. And this was difficult to achieve, was also not desirable in the case of resistant herds that we don't know before if they are or not. And for the risk to eliminate by eliminating a lot of animals, also the few resistant individuals which are 
always present even in the most susceptible herds. This was eventually coupled with the culling of scabiatic individuals. Uh, scabies can be recognized from distance, so you may decide if you want to eliminate with a rifle the affected animals. But it also was difficult to achieve in the necessary amount to have a result for several reasons. One of the reasons is seasonality, because the majority of cases are during winter and it is not easy and often risky to, to move in the mountains in winter. But it is not the single weakness. The culling of scabiatic individual showed to be not desirable in resistant herds, because if you shoot a scabiatic individual, you have a high probability to eliminate an individual which is partially resistant. I mean an individual which will have shown, uh, develop a disease to a certain point and then have all the possibility to cure spontaneously, to recover spontaneously that contribute to the resistance of the herd. Then some uh, managers use also a mass oral treatment. For instance, now with ivermectin, some uh, population of uh, scabies affected Iberian ibex with ivermectin. But this has to do with ethics problem. We may ask ourselves if it is correct or not to treat wildlife because simply they are wildlife and not domestic animals and because also of the environmental impact of some molecules and the, the ivermectin is one of them just to show you what happened with partially resistant individuals this was an iberian ibex that we captured in the sierra nevada in june 2014 it was affected by mange in the lower parts of the body. At that time, we released the animal without treating. And then we managed to recapture the animals more than one year ago, in, uh, one year later in October 2015. And you may see from the image that the animal has more or less the same amount of scabies uh, that are not crusty authentically crusty lesion, which are typical of the severe form. And as you can see, the condition of the animal is a, is a good condition, meaning that this animal was able to coexist with the scabies and probably to transfer this uh, positive character, genetic character to his descendants. As of treatment, once again, modeling was of help in telling us which percentage of animal should have been necessary to treat to obtain a good result from the control of the problem. And the data are quite clear. You should be able to reach the vast majority of animal from 70 to 90 percent to change the demographic curve substantially compared with a non-intervention strategy. And the same was predicted with the culling of animals with over lesions. <clears throat> so you should have had to eliminate at least 80 percent of the animals to change things. And if you know the mountain, if you know these animals, this is just simply impossible. So faced with the mission impossible, the conclusion is the laissez-faire was the strategy and the true objective when you have to deal with a escapees outbreak is to try to reach endemicity as rapidly as possible with a minimum waste of resistant individuals. This was a simple conclusion, but believe me, was the conclusion of many years of studies and discussions. 
adopting a laissez-faire strategies in this case does not mean uh, doing nothing. It means a lot of research and surveillance, for instance, we happen to <clears throat> work on artificial infestation, meant education of people, convincing them that this was a good strategy and not just shooting animals, and even setting trade-off with agencies, for instance, to accept to capture and treat some animals to, to show people that we were doing something. We were convinced that nothing different would have happened by capturing and releasing individual animals, but this was what the manager asked us in that moment, or adapting the hunting strategies to the different epidemiological situation. Now I'm arriving to the end. Another approach that we like very much now is a, a sort of active management by releasing resistant ibex in those populations that were particularly susceptible to the disease to introduce good genetic character in the population and help their recovering and uh, long lasting cohabitation with the pathogen. So finally, just three take on messages. The population rarely work. So the, the bloody strategies uh, are not successful in the case of the majority of wildlife disease problems. Vaccination is good. It permits eradication, but is a rare tool to have. And don't forget that the laissez-faire is an option and is often the best one and may also lead to spontaneous extinction, not in the case of scabies, but as it was demonstrated in the case of several other important diseases. And this is the last one, and I thank you for attention, and I again thank my friend Antonio for this kind invitation. Many thanks, uh, Luca, and uh, it was a really great uh, presentation. And uh, now uh, ask to, to my students if uh, there are uh, any questions for uh, Professor Rossi. I think it was a very deep presentation. Uh, um, I also expect that many of uh, my students doesn't expect uh, um, the end that you, uh, you described, uh, but um, I really agree with, uh, with your thoughts. Any students? Good morning. Good morning, David. Good morning, Prof. So I have a question uh, about the, the globalization that there is now uh, and the, the widespreading of new disease in the world. You think that the laissez-faire strategy is, mm, will be uh, able to, to a good option in the future, even for new diseases that hit uh, wildlife? Uh, <clears throat> I think to understand your question, Davide, um, <clears throat> um, I, I recall you the image of uh, the movie. Uh, it is always a, a different movie. I, I cannot think that the global strategies will be possible for uh, every kind of disease, every kind of uh, situation. So uh, what is really special to the wildlife disease management is that you rely on previous experiences, but you have not in the hand the final of the story. So uh, you, you need to get into the idea that you must create the um, situation permitting you to investigate applied aspect of the new disease appearing and uh, try to control with available tools or rather adopt in, uh, in the absence of a good strategy, the less fair strategy, which as I show you is uh, often the good one because it permits the spontaneous extinction of several diseases. I, once for the other, I recall you of an outbreak of a 
border disease virus in uh, Sham in the Pyrenees, who created several problems in a national reserve of Orlu in, uh, in France. They studied intensively and uh, realized that the disease after a year of uh, good spreading was self-limiting itself. And in fact, it disappeared three or four years ago. This kind of result would have never been forecasted at the beginning, but this was the case. And uh, for sure, other kind of strategies, the population at first would have not had the same result. They would have rather favored at best the endemicity of the disease. Okay. So I, I'm not very much optimistic uh, about what you say, that we will ever reach a global strategy able to protect us from risks like COVID-19 at the moment. Understood. Thank you very much. Other question? Desiree? Fad? It's Harold. all clear for me. Yeah. I just thanks the professor for the great presentation. Okay. Thank you. Desiree. So, <laughs> so um, Luca, if uh, there are no other questions, I uh, thank you again. And uh, I would like to, to see you soon and by person, don't, not by Zoom. And uh, I don't know if uh, maybe here in Sardinia for um, our project on uh, vultures or uh, maybe in, uh, in your place, because uh, it's a lot of time that uh, we didn't see each other. So many thanks again and uh, see you soon. I, I wait for you, Antonio, and I, I thank you again. It was a pleasure to, to be with you and your students. Grazie mille. Ciao, bye bye. Have a nice day. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye boys. Thank bye. you. Bye.